The Sacred Sky is a course offered by the Religion Program at Hunter College that explores the role of the sky in a variety of cultural traditions from ancient Mesopotamia to modern New York City. While the course concentrates on what it is about the sky that allows it to be defined as sacred in so many of the world's religions, it does require a cursory primary understanding of the astronomy of our solar system. My name is Jamie O'Hara. I'm a graduate of the CUNY BA program. Um, I concentrated in religious studies and social justice at Hunter College, and I've been in education ever since I graduated. My name is Leah McMartin. I am a independent freelance artist living in New York City. My name is uh, Troy Griffith. Um, I live in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I took your class, The Sacred Sky, at Hunter College. My name is Richard Gels. I'm uh, 37 years old. I am a student at Hunter College. My name is Shana. I am currently a teacher for the Board of Education and I am currently working on my Master's in Math and Science. Most of the students who take the course are urban dwellers and one of the most remarkable discoveries as each semester unfolds is just how little information they have and how unaware they are of the rhythms of the sky. I had a limited awareness of the sky. I was aware of the sky in general, only to a certain extent. You have to look at my immigration experience from Guyana, South America. Um, when I was there, uh, the moon was just something that we saw and we used for our daily living, especially at night when it was very dark. I grew up in a really rural area in, in Maryland on the eastern shore, and so the sky was always present. It's something that you take for granted, but you appreciate it more when you don't get to see it as much. <laughs> so that was my understanding of the sky. When I came to New York City, um, the moon became less significant. Why? Because we have all these bright lights, we have the street lights, and it wasn't something that you even think about, you know? Um, growing up in New York City, it's really not that visible. So as much as I was always interested in looking up on a clear night, um, the experience of the, the sky and all that it has to offer really wasn't solidified for me until I left the city and moved upstate where I was able to actually see everything that was going on. You live in the city, you see one or two stars in the sky, you see the moon, sometimes it's red. That's the only time I really want to look at the sky. But other than that, it's just there. But then when you go somewhere, like I went to Bangladesh and I saw the real sky and it was wow. It's like billions of stars. You don't. You, you see it. If you Google an image, you'll see billions of stars. But when you go to a place where there's no lights, no technology, you'll see the billions of stars. I have to say, the only reason I ever looked up to the sky was to see whether or not I needed an umbrella, um, whether or not I needed some rain shoes, whether or not I was going to throw my back out shoveling snow. Um, you know, it, it really didn't have much of a significance in my life at all. I definitely was not aware of the sky as a way to mark time or indicate um, time of the year, even time of the day. Um, obviously living in the city that never sleeps, the street lights are always on, you really don't have to abide by time in general. You can kind of create your own schedules and it's always been like that. Our lives doesn't revolve around the sky. Our lives revolves around whatever our schedule tells us <laughs> that we have to do. You know, it's a beautiful day today and then the sun's out and everything and it's going to start setting and then you're going to start thinking, oh, it's five o'clock, I have to be somewhere else. And we're not thinking in terms of the bigger picture. I was only aware of the seasons um, to a, a similarly limited extent. Um, things change, you know, it more kind of marked school beginning and ending than anything uh, more serious. Um, the leaves changed and, and snow was on the ground, but it wasn't um, an experience that I really felt connected to. It wasn't something that carried a lot of significance for me. In New York, we don't think of the sky as part of the earth. Astronomers of every civilization studied the sky, observed cyclical patterns, and understood those patterns to form the basis of a precise and orderly cosmology. They recognized patterns and then used those patterns and connected to their own life. They needed to know when the solstices were coming, when the lunar cycles, they needed to know when that was happening. Monsoons, during monsoon seasons in certain places, they needed to know these things so that they can be prepared or if they're moving, they can move around or they can 
start farming, stop farming, gather their crops. Their society depended on it. Because you start to understand that it's not just a moon up there. The, you know, these, these bodies, the heavenly bodies, actually have meanings to people's lives. And it is dated back in ancient times. You know, it, it was rooted deep in, a, in the human experience. So it was like, wow, this is, an, this is a quote unquote Oprah aha moment that I was having. <laughs> The ancients did track time through monuments that they had constructed, um, but my appreciation of what that process entailed was really deepened after taking the course, um, just because of the exact nature of the of the building projects. You know, where exactly did these people, you know, were able to get this type of information? When asked what were the most significant monuments studied. All the students interviewed answered without hesitation. Chaco Canyon. The Chacos, the Chacos. Chaco Canyon. That was a little, like, I, I, everything about Chaco Canyon was, it's still unbelievable. To me. I think in Chaco Canyon, they were able to do everything. I mean, when scientists went to study it, archaeologists went to study it, they had to make the perfect shadows of what the solstice looks like. And they were able to find out that Chaco Canyon was just right on. And they were able to measure precisely, you know, the highest point of the sun. You know, that, 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 to, that to me is very amazing. It's like, how did they get to that point? They did not have the technology that we have today, that we have today in today's society. Taco Canyon was a personification, basically, of the sky. It's pretty hard to believe that this was done by accident. Um, it's pretty hard to believe that the rocks were there and they drew the spiral. Um, this all had to happen at the same time. And in order for it to happen, there had to be years and years and years of contemplation, calculation. The, the precision of the light shining through these tiny little stone cracks, it's just amazing. It really makes you think, wow, that was important. It was really important to people back then. And they devoted so much time and energy to creating a monument to time, to the sky, to the universe as a whole in the way that it functions. It seems to me that in order to do this, or just the fact that they wanted to do this, um, shows that they had a relationship with the sky that you and I may never be able to appreciate. It makes you wonder what they were celebrating, it makes you wonder uh, what, what the real point of it was. And it, it might seem to me that they were celebrating life itself and that they re recognized that without the sky there could be no life on Earth. The names of the planets and the myths used to tell their story may differ from culture to culture but the desire to unlock the meaning of celestial motion was universal. Um, all different cultures are expressing the human experience and the sky is a huge part of that. And when you think of history, before we had all the light pollution, before we had you know, big cities and before we kind of took the sky for granted, um, you can really grasp how the sky did influence people's beliefs and did influence uh, the stories that they told and, and the values that they developed and the customs that they established. Um, and that kind of gives a universal sense to humanity. Through studying the sky, I, I kind of came to understand my own religion more and my own religious background much more effectively. I mean, I didn't understand that. I mean, I understand why we have to face the Kaaba and face Mecca, but I didn't know how they did it before. Um, I didn't understand why we had a lunar cal calendar and now it makes sense to me. It kind of allowed me to really think about time in a different way. Um, I understood the, the cyclical nature of it. I understood the meaning of it for ancient peoples. And when I moved upstate into a more rural environment, I was able to think about that meaning in terms of my own life. The rhythms of the sky have always told the stories of the earth. The demands of city living offer very few opportunities to notice the rhythm of the sky. And as a result, we have very few urban sky myths. Yet sky symbols, usually in the form of the zodiac, are embedded in the architecture of New York City. But finding the stars in the city requires a shift in perception. I was a little bit surprised to find that there were astronomical symbols embedded in the architecture of New York City. Never once did it occur to me that there would be um, sky symbols <laughs> in any buildings at all. Um, just because, like I said, I don't think of 
New York is an ideal environment to appreciate the relationship between the sky and humanity. These symbols were all over New York City. It was all over buildings. It made sense that there would be sky symbols, but it didn't necessarily make sense that there would be meaning behind them or that the person who put them there intended them to be there for any reason other than artistic value. I went and I looked at Atlas. Which is located in front of the Rockefeller Center International Building. The architects were, um, were very aware of the significance of Atlas when they decided to correlate and build Atlas with Rockefeller Center. I mean, Atlas is holding the entire universe on his shoulders. The creator having Atlas in front of the Rockefeller Center International Building, holding that sphere with all those astrological symbols. Which represents that he is holding the entire universe on his shoulder. I mean, all the planets. It signified a lot because it was built during the Great De Depression and nobody had much faith in Rockefeller Center succeeding in any way. And in a sense, I guess, Symbolically, Rockefeller, that building itself was holding the entire world on its shoulder because trying to get our society out of the Great Depression, trying to bring jobs, trying to produce jobs, and I guess it's, it's symbolic. I mean, we still use it in a symbolic manner. Grand Central is the hub of New York, and it is also the hub of time. So to stop and look up, it's, it's a completely different experience because you're just standing still looking up and you're just observing and you're taking the time to really appreciate the zodiac on the ceiling, which I never took time to notice, and I doubt many people do because they're too busy running through. It represents, you know, the universe as a whole and how we are not separate from it. Uh, there was a zodiac belt on the floor at the entrance to the Lowell Library at Columbia University. The architect and the Lowe's decided to deliberately use the zodiac belt because in Renaissance times, it was understood to be the sum total of human knowledge. The way I understood it was that a university is a house of knowledge. It's the goal of a university to gather as much knowledge as it possibly can. So what better way to symbolize everything than to put a symbol for space and a symbol for the unknown. To put that at the entrance of a library kind of gives the library a sense of purpose as a vehicle to gather as much information as possible. Because there's so much going on in New York City. I mean, it is such a diverse population of people, diverse in st terms of status also. You see like the lowest of the low, the highest of the high. In terms of knowledge, you see everything. In terms of occupation, you see everything in New York City. So I can see it being the city of all the stars. Our modern world is part of a digital universe that calculates calendars, appointments, alarms, alerts, reminders through man-made devices. Yet despite our reliance on digital rhythms, the sky still inspires. And its majesty, so powerful to our ancestors for so many reasons, still holds us in its thrall. Okay, every day there are people who look up in the sky and are getting inspired to write music, to, you know, do movies. I think that if people understood that they're not disconnected from space, that they're made of the same elements of the things that are in space, um, they can begin to develop a better understanding of their, themselves and the connectedness to everything else on Earth. If, if I should talk to any of my peers, colleagues, professionals, uh, professors, when you talk to these people, you know, you, you talk to them, their politics are different. You talk to them, our economical standards are different. But at the end of the night, when we go to bed at night, you know, we look through our windows, whether you might, you know, be in Guyana or New York, we look up, oh, there's the sky, there's the moon. And that's one experience that no borders could ever take away from us, you know? The sky is borderless. The sky offers more than a weather forecast. The sky really does become something to be lived. Um, once you start to begin to understand your relationship to it, your connectedness to it, um, it brings you one step closer to be feeling like a whole complete entity rather than something floating around meaninglessly on a rock. 
but of course the sky will forever be our shared experience. It is the one common thread that connects that boy in the slums of New Delhi to me who live in Brooklyn. Everyone took the time to look at the sky as a shared cultural resource. Then there would be a greater appreciation for other, other cultures and other people um, and a bit more respect amongst humanity as a whole. Regardless of who you are, what you've been, where you've been doing, we're all connected through the sky. And that's something that no politician, no Geneva Convention could ever touch. <laughs> the stars and the sky inspire me in the sense that they remind me that I'm part of a much larger picture here on Earth and beyond, I guess you can say, the universe as a whole. Um, the infinite nature of it kind of grounds me in my own personal life. And it also makes me realize that um, everything that I do somehow has an impact in a much greater scheme. My understanding of humanity or, or being a human revolves around a feeling of wholeness. And to participate in wholeness, you have to understand the whole. And if you leave parts out, you'll never be able to comprehend what your true position is. And by incorporating the majesty of the universe, the stars, the supernovas, the planets, um, different galaxies, you know, understanding that that is a part of who we are and who we can be uh, really is a step towards understanding that wholeness. And so I feel like people should, should really give the sky a chance and try to understand its significance. And it's a beautiful thing to look at.